When the Peugeot 408 was announced, I was left absolutely jaw dropped due to its sumptuous design. And indeed looking at it in person, it looks even better. Now the 408 starts from roughly 31,000 pounds. That's for the regular petrol model. However, I'm interested in the plug-in hybrid and that starts from just shy of 40,000 pounds. Of course, that's for the entry level Allura trim. If you go for the GT trim, it'll cost you roughly 43,000 pounds without adding any additional extras. Now it is worth considering that this vehicle is very very similar if not identical to the Citroen C5X Hybrid which I absolutely loved. Not only was its soft suspension system a work of art but it also had a ridiculous 74 to 75 miles per gallon which to me was absolutely unheard of on a plug-in hybrid. So in this review you're going to see how this vehicle compares to its Citroen sibling and to see if it's actually worth its price tag. So to kick off this review we have to jump straight in and talk about fuel economy. Indeed over here, this is one of the key selling points of the 408 hybrid, and the same could have been said about the Citroen C5X hybrid. Now here you've got a 12.4 kilowatt hour battery pack, which combines with a 40 liter petrol fuel tank, and therefore means that you should be able to attain roughly 350 miles on a singular sitting. Of course, if you do not want to stop to recharge or to refuel for any given reason. Now the manufacturer claims that you can get roughly 40 miles of electric range, which is actually quite fascinating because it's a little bit better than the Citroen and as such has a different benefit in kind taxation and therefore means that you can actually save a bit of money going for the Peugeot over in comparison to the Citroen just due to the extra amount of electric range that the manufacturer claims. Now for my own mixed driving test I actually netted roughly 30 miles of electric range which is a little bit below the manufacturer's claim and indeed sits somewhat in between some of its competitors. Now what really does stand out in comparison to its rivals however is the sheer amount of fuel efficiency. Now here I netted 70 to 75 mpg which is absolutely ridiculous in any given sense. Indeed over here the Citroen C5X hybrid is the only other vehicle that kind of sits next to it and therefore they just sit in a league of their own. Now in this respect if you look at some of its competitors you have got the Cupra 4 Mentor e-hybrid which netted 64 mpg, the Suzuki A-Cross PHEV at 55 to 61 mpg, the Skoda Octavia IV and the Honda HRV and the Nissan Qashqai e-Power 50 to 55 mpg, the Hyundai Tucson PHEV and the Nissan X-Trail e-Power netted 40 to 43 mpg and the Range Rover Evoque at 40 mpg. So yes indeed this vehicle and the Citroen really do stand out and therefore mean it's a certain consideration for those people that actually want to bolster the overall fuel economy. Now something I thought I should point out is that the 408 hybrid does actually have the ability to self-charge its battery pack and indeed over here via the e-save option which you can enable through the infotainment system it allows the petrol engine to effectively replenish the battery pack which is quite handy for example if you're on the motorway like I am right now then you can effectively use the petrol engine where it's, it's, it's most efficient to replenish the battery pack and therefore means that when you're coming into any sort of city scenarios then you're effectively going to be able to use some of that electric portion which is very very useful and good thinking by the manufacturer. The only worthwhile consideration is that if you are going to be driving in the city and enabling the e-save option it is going to severely impact your overall fuel economy so just worth considering using it tactically rather than at any given point. Now, aside from that, you do also have a degree of regenerative braking. B mode, to be more specific, there's a button found towards the center console and effectively means that when you lift off from the accelerator pedal, like for example, if I do right now, I'm gonna start decelerating instead of just simply coasting. So here, if I were to disable B mode and just do the same thing at roughly the same speed, I start coasting without having to, I actually have to press on the brake pedal because it looks like the vehicle in front of me is trying to kind of nip in. I might be wrong, but anyway. So what I'm trying to say over here is that the regenerative braking mode is useful because it allows you to effectively be a little bit more efficient. It is a little bit cumbersome that you have to enable it each time you step a foot inside the vehicle but that's pretty much the same sort of behavior that could be said about pretty much all of the plug-in hybrids out there on the market so I can't be overly critical of the manufacturer. 
Now, aside from recouping energy while you're on the move, you can, of course, plug it in because it is a PHEV after all. Now, the Hevier via the Type 2 port it is actually quite disappointing that the manufacturer's onboard charger is rated at 3.6 kilowatts, which means going from 0 to 100% using an appropriate charger, which would probably be a 7 kilowatt wall box, will take you roughly three and a half hours. Now, this time can severely be brought down to roughly one hour and 40 minutes if you go for the 7 kilowatt onboard charger your option which will cost you 400 pounds i just think it's disappointing that a vehicle that costs 40,000 pounds doesn't have a seven kilowatt or if not higher input charger available as standard but alas that's just something that you should consider now if you're going to be plugging it in via a regular three pin socket it's going to take you a lot longer roughly five and a half hours to be more specific so again something worth considering that if you do have access to a wall box certainly something that you might want to look at because you can really Really bring down that time to recharge and therefore operate on electric mode as much as possible. Speaking of which, this does actually perfectly bring me on to performance and here the plug-in hybrid models are the most powerful. Now the Allure, which is the entry level trim, is only available with the 180 configuration, in other words 180 horsepower. If however you go for the Allure Premium or the GT, you'll have access to the 225, which is of course 225 horsepower and that's exactly what I have on test. Now here there is a 1.6 litre four-cylinder turbocharged petrol engine which drives the front wheels only and when combined with the electric motor and its battery pack it outputs 165 kilowatts and indeed 225 horsepower and 360 newton meters of torque. Now I actually had this tested via Race Logic's performance box touch from 0 to 20 miles an hour in 1.92 seconds, 0 to 30 miles an hour in 2.95 seconds, 0 to 60 miles an hour in 7.01 seconds and 50 to 70 miles an hour in just 3.15 seconds therefore making it very handy when you're just doing a kick down or of course a overtaking maneuver on the motorway as for top speed it is limited to 140 to 145 miles an hour depending on which model you go for and you can also drive up to 84 miles an hour in pure ev modes now the 408 hybrid's performance is certainly impressive, at least for a vehicle of its class. However, it's worth noting that it does take a little bit of a delay if you're gonna initiate a kick down, and therefore the vehicle does take a little bit of time to respond. The same sort of comments could be said about its eight-speed automatic transmission, where if you're gonna be flicking through the gears, for example, in sport mode, it does take a little bit of extra time to respond, which isn't the same that could be said about some sportier PHEVs out there on the market, such as, for example, the Cupra 4 Mentor or the BMW. X Drive 25e. Effectively, over here, it's not exactly a overly sporty vehicle, but it's just something that you should consider. If you have it in automatic mode, it will seamlessly go through the eight gears, and therefore means that it's not something that you'll probably have to worry about at any given point. Now, I would, however, like to commend the manufacturer for the seamless transition between pure EV mode and petrol mode. Indeed, it's absolutely beautiful. You won't even notice it while you're sitting. All you will see is the instrument cluster and your speed going from blue to white, whereby white is in petrol mode and in blue, it's in pure EV mode. Just while I was talking there in that short segment, it went from petrol to EV mode and back again. And indeed, I wasn't able to hear it or feel it, and you probably weren't able to note it either. What I'm trying to say over here is that it is a great sort of experience for any sort of driver. Now, another thing that I really love is the overall driver's input. Yet again, it's not going to compare with more sportier alternatives, specifically those who operate for an all-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive configuration, because this is purely a front-wheel drive vehicle, but the driver's input due to, in part, of this small little hexagonally shaped steering wheel is absolutely great. It really brings a smile to my face when I'm putting my foot down to the metal on winding country roads. Now, its suspension system has also been tuned a little bit different from the Citroen, at least from my knowledge, and therefore means that when you're going around on these more winding roads, you will find that the vehicle does actually grip pretty well and doesn't suffer from too much body roll. On the flip side, however, it does mean that when you're pottering around town, it's no match to the likes of the floaty like suspension of the Citroen C5X Hybrid. So it really depends as to what you're looking for. Something a bit more sporty and a bit more nimble feeling, it's gonna be the Peugeot 408. However, if you want something that's just gonna be gliding over bumps and gonna give you a bit more body roll, then it's gonna be the Citroen C5X Hybrid. 
Now, aside from how it is on the road, what about when you're sat within the cabin? Well, here I'm really pleased to report that it does give you a really nice, quiet environment. And that is actually because you have got a treated windscreen and also in the Allure Premium and GT trim, which I'm sat in, you've also got laminated front windows, all of which just add to the overall experience. In fact, if you want a detailed breakdown of the sound measurements that are recorded within the 408 Hybrid, do check out my detailed audio review that can be found up on your pop banner down description below and in the pinned comments. Now past that, when it comes to its interior design, I've got no complaints whatsoever. Sure enough, it won't compete with some more premium offerings out there from the likes of, let's say, Mercedes-Benz or the likes of Audi or other, but when it comes to a vehicle of its class, it certainly does look and feel the part. Specifically in the GT trim, I absolutely love the upholstery work that's been done on the seats, the overall stitching work, the materials around the dashboard, and this absolutely cute little steering wheel. I absolutely love it. Now I did commend this in the E208 and E2008, where this vehicle kind of sits in between those two. And here you've got this really nice and easy to grip steering wheel, which gives you that overall heightened sense of driver's input as well, which I did cover just before. But I really love this design and I know it won't be for everyone, but I really am fond of it. Now, what about when it comes to the use of technology? Well, at the center, you have got a slightly angled 10 inch display. It's very vivid, intuitively laid out and pretty responsive. I'm not too fond of the transitions that Peugeot has used because it just does take a little bit of extra time when you're swiping between menus. I think the transition time could be optimized. For those Android geeks out there, it feels like the manufacturer would have had to go in sort of developer options and increase the transition speed. Now, nonetheless, over here, the display itself does give you all the right sorts of options that you'll require and better still supports Android Auto and Apple CarPlay over a wireless transmission. If you're going to be using Bluetooth only, you'll be limited to the lowest quality SBC codec. So it's certainly something that you might want to avoid. So here it's great to see that a good use of technology is there, at least on the main infotainment system. Now, better still, these third party operating systems do actually feed through navigation data straight to the instrument cluster. And here you've also got a fully digitalized 10 inch display. In fact, in some of the trims, you've even got a 3D cockpit design. And personally, I do think it's kind of excessive and not really needed, but thankfully you can easily toggle this on and off via the infotainment system. Nonetheless, over here, the instrument cluster itself is customizable to a certain degree, and you can even go via the infotainment system to customize the widgets to pretty much your heart's content. I just want to say over here that I really should commend the manufacturer for actually integrating navigation data through the instrument cluster. Although it is a shame that no matter which trim level you go for, indeed, option, you do not have a head up display because it would have been great to add the overall safety credentials. Now, shifting our attention back towards the center of the dashboard, you might have noticed a secondary display, and these are called the virtual eye toggle buttons. Indeed, something right out of Apple's marketing book. Now, nonetheless, the eye toggle buttons are effectively shortcuts for certain settings that you can access on the infotainment system, making it quite handy. For example, if you just want to go on to Android Auto rather than having to faff around with the infotainment system or find finding it within the application drawer, or for example, if you just want to see, let's say your energy consumption, all very handy. And I really do like what the manufacturer has done over here. Now, better still, you do have a few physical buttons found just below this screen because here you have got some climate control shortcuts and also a shortcut towards the ADAS systems, which are very handy. So therefore, if you do want to toggle on and off lane keep assist, which I will touch upon very shortly, you can do so by pretty much a press and then a touch of a button. You then also have a physical volume wheel, which is all very handy no matter what sort of scenario you're in. Now, this does actually perfectly bring me onto the audio system that's comprised within the 408. And here, what you'll find as standard is a six speaker audio system without a subwoofer. If however, you do want a subwoofer or more specifically a 10 speaker Focal audio system, then you're gonna have to splash out an additional 600 pounds while opting for the GT trim only. Indeed, the upgraded audio system for some given reason isn't available in the cheaper trims. Now, if you want more details, do check out the audio review that I did reference before. Again, as a reminder, it'll be down in the description below or indeed in the pinned comments. 
Speaking about the more expensive trim levels, I do find it quite cheeky that in this day and age, a manufacturer is charging extra for a QI wireless charging bay. And indeed over here, it costs 100 pounds in the Allure Premium and GT trims. And yes, it has been omitted altogether from the entry level Allure trim. I'm not sure why either. Now, apart from that, however, I've got no complaints whatsoever when it comes to the overall storage within the cabin. Here, the glove box has been optimized even for right-hand drive vehicles. Towards the center console, you've got a small little cubby hole which sits alongside a USB Type-C port which can be used to connect up to the infotainment system and a 12 volt socket which can be useful for powering let's say a dash cam. Further down you have got two cup holders which can be found underneath a retractable tray. Then further down you've got a small little area where you can place let's say your wireless key fob and then you've also got the center armrest compartment which also has got a small amount of storage and also will reveal a USB Type-C port which is solely used for charging. On that note there are further two USB Type-C ports found at the rear of the center console for your rear occupants. Now, as for the door bins, the front two have actually been lined in fabric, which is really handy. Therefore means that any sort of loose change or keys won't be heard rattling around when you're traversing uneven terrain. And also given the fact that they're pretty large, it means that it can accommodate a 500 milliliter bottle alongside some small size valuables. At the rear, however, it's a little bit more limited and these door bins haven't been lined in any sort of fabric, which is slightly a shame. But then you will find two cup holders, which can be found within the pull down armrest compartment. And here you'll also find a small little area which can be handy for placing a smartphone. Now, aside from storage within the cabin, you have, of course, got its boot. Now, you have got a manually operated tailgate in the Allure and the Allure Premium. If, however, you go for the GT trim, which is on review, you'll have an electric operated tailgate. Now, it's smartly operated where you can swipe your feet towards the bottom of the bumper. I'm not going to try and attempt that because sometimes it seems to be hit and miss. But thankfully, there's a button found within the cabin on the remote and also just above the number plate and therefore means that it does open up and close actually pretty quickly. Now it's also got that hatchback design, which I absolutely love. Therefore, meaning that when I'm coming to loading in and out goods, it's no problem whatsoever, including for someone like myself who just sits under six foot. It's also quite easy to reach the button over here. I feel if you're quite shorter even, you can still just about reach this button. Or of course, you can initiate it via the remote. Now, in terms of the overall capacity, it is rated at 471 liters. And if you were to prop down the seats, this extends up to 1,545 liters. Now, it is worth noting that if you do go for the petrol model, therefore not the hybrid that is on review, you will actually have more boot capacity at 536 litres and 1611 litres respectively. Elsewhere, if you do go for the upgraded audio system, which is only present as an option in the top spec GT trim, this will also dampen the amount of space that you've got purely because of the positioning of the subwoofer. Nonetheless, I do think it will suffice for a lot of consumers. Now on that note over here, you will find an underfloor compartment, which is actually pretty handy for placing your charging cables. And then you've also got 60, 40 rear split folding seats with an integrated ski latch, making it quite handy. Better still in the GT trim, you've also got a release mechanism, which can be initiated from the rear of the vehicle, making it even more practical to use on a day-to-day -day basis. And just to add the cherry on top, you have also got a flat loading bay. Now, aside from transporting goods, what about when it comes to giving someone a lift? Well, here at the rear of the cabin, as someone who's just under six foot, I can almost fully stretch out my legs. And indeed, this is one of the key traits of the Peugeot 408 and the likes of the Citroen C5X hybrid. And that's purely because of its kind of unique form factor. It's somewhat like an estate and SUV crossed into one. However, this does have a negative impact because if you do compare it to some larger sized SUVs, they will offer better headroom. Here, I'm just under six foot and I do feel a little bit hemmed in. If I was six foot two, then I would feel like kind of scraping at the top of the headliner. But still for children or for example, younger adults, it will be a non-issue. Furthermore, given the fact that you have actually got an optimized transmission tunnel, it means the rear middle occupant can actually be sat with good comfort even on longer journeys. Now on that note here, the seats themselves are actually really nice and soft. Not as soft as its Citroen sibling, but still pretty good. I've got no problems whatsoever when it comes to comfort at the rear of the cabin and equally at the front of the cabin. Specifically here, if you go for one of the more expensive trim levels, because you have an even better and nicer material and stitching work, and even can have a massage function, which I absolutely love. This really does bolster the overall comfort. However, as standard, you'll have manually adjustable seats and also a lumbar support for the driver. 
if indeed you do want a heated seat and also a massage function, you're going to have to splash out on the driver and seat pack, which comes in at £1,100 and therefore add 10-way electric controls with 4-way lumbar support. This is only available in the GT trim. As for the steering wheel, it is heated as standard in the top spec GT trim, although it will cost you an additional £150 in the Allure Premium. Finally, in terms of the panoramic glass roof, it's only available in the GT trim as an option for £900. Now, the latter option is certainly appreciated as it draws in some beautiful sunlight within the cabin. However, if you do not want it and you want to have the sunshade, then you're going to have to reach back pretty far back, to say the least. So much so that if I've got one hand on the steering wheel, one hand on the sunshade, it almost looks like I'm doing sort of a robot dance that Peter Crouch would be proud of. Anyway, if you reach back, then you can bring in the sunshade. And yes, it's only manually operated. It would have been great due to the things that I've just highlighted over here that the manufacturer would have incorporated an electronically controlled sunshade via the regular controls and therefore meant it a little bit more practical specifically when you've got your hands on the wheel. Now speaking about the sunroof this does actually perfectly bring me onto its exterior design and indeed no matter where you look it certainly does look the part. The vehicle has got a striking look at the front thanks in part due to the headlights and also the oversized grill. Towards the side, you have got 17-inch alloys that come fitted as standard on the Allure and 19-inch alloys that come fitted as standard in the Allure Premium and the GT. You can actually opt for 20-inch alloys if you so wish for an additional £300 in the GT trim only. Now, as for the rear of the vehicle, it certainly has Peugeot's DNA written all over it, namely due to the taillight design. But better still, it has also got a sportier flare thanks to the integrated spoiler and the small little shark fins that are positioned on either side. Now these are actually done on purpose, not only just for the aerodynamics, but also because they add some extra headroom at the rear of the cabin. Now just to complete the design of the vehicle, it comes in a sumptuous colour. Indeed, Obsession Blue, which comes fitted as standard, is the one pictured. But of course, if it doesn't fit your sort of style, then you might want to go for one of the other colour options, which will cost you between £650 to £850. Pounds. Now moving past this exterior design, let's talk about crash safety. And here it was awarded 4 out of 5 stars by Euro NCAP, scoring 76% in adult occupancy, 84% in child occupancy, and 65% in the safety assist scores. Now I can touch upon the latter having tested the driver assistance systems. And here, as standard, you have got automatic post-collision braking system, advanced emergency braking system with radar assist, intelligent speed adaptation, extended traffic recognition, driver attention warning, cruise control and lane keep assist which by the way can be easily toggled on or off and it's worth bearing in mind that this will be enabled each time you power on the vehicle due to one of your NCAP's rules. As a result here you might want to use one of the shortcuts or indeed press one of the physical buttons down on the dashboard and therefore allow you to quickly toggle on or off said setting. Now past that, if you go for the Allure Premium, you will also have adaptive cruise control with stop and go technology and also a blind spot detection system. Now I will say that the adaptive cruise control does do a decent job, although sometimes fail to regulate the speed of the vehicle in front, specifically when it's braking. And as a result, sometimes I had a little bit of a harsh braking, specifically when it came to, let's say, coming up to a roundabout. Nonetheless, over here, you'll probably have to take over yourself anyway, but it's just worth considering. Now, as for the top spec GT trim, it also adds lane position assistance, which effectively keeps you centered in the lane. Now, this, on the other hand, was an absolute treat, specifically on longer journeys, as it meant it took away the stress on those more mundane trips. Now, you have also got Drive Assist 2.0, which is effectively semi-automatic lane changing and is available as a £500 option in the Allure Premium and GT trims only. Then you've also got Night Vision, which identifies pedestrians and animals in low light conditions. This is only available in the GT trim and will cost a whopping £1,300. Now, moving past this, I would like to have a quick word about parking the vehicle. And indeed, it has got a unique form factor, which means it's not quite an estate, an SUV or a fastback, but rather sits in between. And therefore, just your spatial awareness will have to take kind of getting used to. 
Nonetheless, it's still very easy to maneuver. And indeed, due to the light steering wheel and the fact that you've got rear parking sensors and 180 degree reversing camera fitted as standard, it makes it quite easy to go into a parking space. Although it's worth mentioning that rear view visibility is quite limited. Thankfully, however, visibility towards the side and at the front are pretty good. Although I'm not too fond of the placement of the rear view mirror, which is a complaint I've had of other vehicles from the Stellantis group. Now past this, if you do want to have full coverage of the vehicle, you might want to go for the Allure Premium or GT trim and add a 450 pound option in order to get fantastic high resolution 360 degree cameras. Elsewhere in said trims, you will also have rear cross traffic alerts and front parking sensors, which are certainly handy in certain scenarios. So with all that in mind, it brings us on to our verdict. And quite frankly, the Peugeot 408 Hybrid really does tick a lot of boxes. It's got a stunning exterior design, a practical and snazzy interior, good legroom at the rear due to its somewhat unique form factor, and then a sizable boot. Then you've also got pretty fun driving dynamics due to its steering wheel feel and also due to the manufacturer's configuration. And then just to add the cherry on top, you have got phenomenal fuel economy. At 70 to 75 mpg, it is class leading. As a result, we can certainly see ourselves recommending it and it gets our best buy award. Now, it's worth considering, however, that the Citroen C5X Hybrid, the Stellantis Group sibling, is arguably the better pick. And the reason behind that is because it's got an even more practical interior due to physical climate controls. It has also got a floaty-like suspension feel, and while it won't exactly have the same sort of driving dynamics as the Peugeot, it also comes in at a cheaper price point, all while giving you still incredible fuel economy. So the Citroen will still take the top spot, but the Peugeot would come in at a close second. Now, of course, you have got other alternatives from the likes of, let's say, Suzuki, Honda and Nissan, some of which you might want to consider and ones that we've reviewed will be down in the description below. Now, we'd be curious to know which vehicle you would pick down in the comment section below and would you pick the Peugeot over the Citroen or vice versa? Now, of course, if you've liked this independent detail review, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification, all of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been Chris from Totally EV and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.